All right, good morning, everybody. So we'll get, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So Stephen has already prayed for us, so we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, handouts are going around. Um, today we're going to look at continuing our study of Dr. Kruger's book. Uh, lesson 8, do we really need God? Can, can't science explain everything? So, Christianity and science. In 25 minutes. So, that's all right. Um, we're good. Um, my, my goal is actually very modest. Uh, my goal is very um, basic. Uh, this is a huge topic, as all of these questions have been. So, I just want to give us a few bullet points to think about um, as we think about the various questions and objections that we come across in, in the world. Now, so this is a big one. So which, uh, point number one is just last week we dealt with suffering, and we're going to, uh, if you have any questions on that, please talk to me uh, afterward. I'm happy to talk to you. We're going to dive right into question number two, which is just the, the actual question itself. And the question I want to think about for a few minutes, how does Christianity fit with science, faith and reason? This is this is question's been around for a long, long time. Faith and reason, faith and science. How, how do we um, think about those and bring those two ideas together? Put it another way: Must I abandon my Bible uh, to embrace the scientific consensus? Another way to think about it. Again, the issue of faith and reason. Uh, there are some, um, you know, more more strident naturalists. That is, evolutionists. Um, atheists that would answer that question with a vehement yes, that I need to get rid of your Bible uh, when thinking about science. Uh, Richard, a quote by Richard Dawkins uh, writes, there is no heaven, Richard Dawkins, one of the famous what's called new atheists, uh, he, uh, I think he's somewhere in Cambridge or Oxford maybe, he's a professor of, of the evolutionary biology, something like that. Um, do what? You hold Darwin's Oh, there you go. He, yeah, he holds Darwin's feet. Which, which university? Do you remember? Cambridge. Cambridge. Um, he's one of the more well-known, uh, kind of militant, what's called new atheists. Um, There's no heaven or afterlife, he writes. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. Um, he also writes about those who would um, not hold to evolution. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. So he, you know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you really think? Um, so he's pretty um, clear. But that, you know, that's 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 the question to think about today. Is Christianity opposed to science? Yeah, a modest a modest goal this morning. Is Christianity opposed to science? There's a lot of questions we're not going to have time to get into. And the short answer is no. There, there's a short answer. Is Christianity opposed to science? No. That, that's, that's where we're going to go. And I have one, two, three, three bullet points to give you as we, as we think through this, kind of three broad headings. That if you want to do some more study, um, that would be a great thing, great thing to do. The first is history. Uh, what about the history of this question? Um, I'm not a historian. So again, there's a lot of articles written on this. But Christianity in science and history. Um, there is a very close relationship, in fact, between Christianity and science uh, throughout history, particularly during the time of the Reformation, uh, during the 17th century. A very close relationship between theology and <coughs> science, between faith and reason. Um, the scientific method, uh, I think Francis Bacon, the you know, famous. Uh, founder of the science, founder, you know, uh, discoverer, so to speak, of the scientific method, um, was an Anglican. Uh, so Bacon was an Anglican. Kepler, Robert Boyle, Blaise Pascal, Gregor Mendel, the, the geneticist, a lot of other big names you may may jog your memory from back in high school or college. Um, uh, were Christians. Now, I'm not saying that they were all reformed. Um, at all. Um, a lot of them had kind of aberrant views, but working from a general theistic worldview as opposed to a hardened atheistic worldview. Um, we need to be balanced uh, with our history. 
Um, now let me ask you this. Why should that not surprise us? Why should that not really be surprising? That throughout history, um, there's been a, a close relationship between scientific endeavor and theology or faith. That really shouldn't surprise us to think about it. Yep, there it is. God created it all things. Okay, very good. So, yes, absolutely right. God is creator of foundation. Now, what does that mean? What, what does that imply? Well, the study of science would be the study of God and the harmony of science. Yep, absolutely. Um, Dr. Kruger, uh, yeah, um, God is the God of order. Dr. Kruger in his book, Christians have viewed the scientific enterprise as a way to uncover and explore what God did when he created the world. God created it. He's a God of order. Uh, the world in which we live is an orderly world, and it's, it's thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, uh, discovering what God has done in his creation is the scientific uh, the scientific endeavor. Um, Kepler, pretty important guy. Uh, you heard Johannes Kepler? Very important guy. This is what he says. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God. So it's to discover all the wonders out there. I mean, it is an amazing, amazing world in which we live that God created. He spoke into existence. And we um, believers who are engaged in science, it, it's discovering and uncovering all the glorious works of God. Um, Quite excited, you know, when you see it from a you know, from a Christian perspective. Um, so that's 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 just bullet point number one. Um, again, we're going to do it rather quickly. Bullet point number one, uh, the simplest is just there's a a robust history uh, between of of the close relationship between science, scientific endeavor, and Christianity. So let's let's move on. We'll talk when we have questions uh, towards the end. We're going to spend a little more time on this next one. This next one is, I have a question there. Does science need Christianity? And I have need there in, in quotes. That's kind of the, the million dollar question. What do I mean when I say does science need Christianity? So let, me, let me just talk to see what you think. We can go in a few different directions. When that, when that question is put that way, does science need Christianity? Any thoughts? What might we go? Nathan, I'll you. Uh, it, it does because. How does it? Yeah. We have, uh, we understand absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And science, in order to study science at all, you need absolute truth. Okay. If, if you don't, then who knows if I could get response. Yep, yeah, okay. So, okay, two points there. Let's talk about the idea of absolute truth. And science is a, the pursuit of truth, right? I mean, the pursuit of discovering um, God's truth that He wove into this world. Um, Christianity, we talked about in one of our first talks, provides the only rational foundation for absolute truth. Then you said, the last thing you said was what? Do you remember? <laughs> Something about knowing tomorrow. Uh, knowing that, that things are going to remain the same. The things are going to remain the same. That's a big one. <laughs> um, we'll come back to that. But that's, that's a big one. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Kind of temper man's hubris. Temper man's hubris. What do you mean? Well, I mean, in terms of, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Um, it'll humble us. Yeah, just because we discover things doesn't mean we have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, in order to guard against incorrect conclusions, um, okay. if you take the wrong assumptions that don't fit within the truth, then you arrive at bad ideas like evolution, which presupposes right. that God doesn't exist. It doesn't conclude that. True. Very true. Yes. Um, yeah. Here. Well, the whole realm of, of what is versus what ought to be at yeah. its highest and best, science measures what is. What is? Yeah. But it doesn't really tell us what ought to be. Correct. It's That's the realm of, of you know theology, morality, mm -hmm. right. metaphysics. Yeah, metaphysics. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So let me let me uh, a few thoughts uh, um, teaching us out a little bit. Science only works, and that's in quotes, only works within a Christian worldview. Science only works within a Christian worldview. The entire, again to quote Dr. Kruger, the entire scientific enterprise is built on certain 
philosophical principles, a couple of which Nathan mentioned earlier. Certain things in the scientific endeavor are assumed. They are taken for granted, whether they are acknowledged or not. The Christian scientists will not readily acknowledge it, uh, the Christian worldview in which he or she is studying, is doing their work. The non-Christian scientists will not acknowledge, obviously does not acknowledge, um, the Christian foundation that is underneath all that they are doing. I'll put it this way. Um, unbelieving scientist is borrowing from the Christian worldview. One of my favorite <coughs> theologians, a guy by the name of Cornelius Van Til, has the idea of borrowed capital. That the unbelieving scientist, whether acknowledged or not, is borrowing from the Christian worldview. And oftentimes, most of the time, unbelieving scientists will not acknowledge that. But they are borrowing from that worldview. It's the idea of arguing that air does not exist. To argue that air does not exist, you need what? Air, right? Uh, to, to make the argument that air doesn't exist, you're actually borrowing air. Um, that is what is going on uh, in, in, in this, this idea. Put it another way. Science needs a worldview in which the universe operates in a uniform fashion. Science needs a worldview in which the uniform, excuse me, where am I, lost my place. Um, science needs a worldview in which the, the universe operates in a uniform fashion, in which it is orderly. Now there's actually a name to this. Anyone know the name to this idea that we're talking about? Yes. Uniformity of nature. Uniformity of nature, right? The uniformity of nature, which means what? Well, it's kind of what Nathan said, that you can expect a certain outcome from, you know, the present. Right. Water boils at 212, or water freezes at 32 degrees. Yep, yep, absolutely. So that we, we can reasonably expect that how things work today is how they're going to work tomorrow. That's the uniformity of nature. We take this, we assume this every day. Uh, we go to sleep at night, we pretty sure we're going to wake up the next morning. Uh, we perform experiments, water boils at X temperature, therefore we can deduce from that that, water, that the boiling point of water is blank. And we can then work from that assumption, the uniformity of nature, that nature works in a uniform way. Now why is Christians, why, 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 why is that um, like a, of course that makes perfect sense to believers. What, how does the Christian worldview underwrites or stands underneath it provides the foundation for the uniformity of nature that nature is orderly that tomorrow will work pretty much like today yeah Matt? Because we believe the scripture tells us that God not only creates it but upholds it yep God creates he created orderly he sustains think Genesis chapter 8 um, seed time and harvest you know the Lord has built into his creation um, an orderliness that he will sustain until he returns. And that is foundational to the entire scientific enterprise. Um, the, the famous term for it is induction. Laws of induction. I know uh, in, inductive Bible study or inductive reasoning is what? You know what inductive reasoning is? Yeah, yeah. Inductive reasoning is where you say the sun comes up every morning. It has always come up every morning. Therefore, I, did, I inductively say it will come up the next morning. It's where you use any number of prior examples to establish um, the, the future way it's going to keep working. Right, yeah, so inductive reasoning, um, exactly what, uh, what Joe said. Reasoning from specific occasions to general principles. Inductive reasoning. I'm going to do a bunch of experiments. Every one, water boils at this temperature. Every individual experiment. Therefore, the general principle is the boiling point of water is X. I do all these things that happen today, all these experiments today. Therefore, tomorrow is going to be the same. Next day is going to be the same. Next day is going to be the same. That is the foundation for the scientific method. Everybody got that? Scientific method is grounded in, only makes sense in a world in which, a world that works like this. It's actually a very famous problem in philosophy. Um, one of the most oldest challenges and questions in the history of philosophy is called the problem of induction. 
Um, and we have, a, as Christians, we have a very, we have a good basic answer for it. God creates it that way, He sustains it, and it's going to be that way until He returns. How do we know that? He tells us in the Bible. Um, but if you reject the Bible, you have a big problem explaining it. Therefore, it's the problem of induction. Um, again, as believers, we have a very um, basic way to understand this. Science assumes the uniformity of nature to arrive at these conclusions. A scientist can, an unbelieving scientist can do science. Um, a lot of very intelligent, unbelieving scientists, and we're, I'm very thankful for the work that they've done, that they, that they have accomplished by God's common grace. And we use those, we use those advancements every day uh, in our world. Um, they can do science, but they can't account for science. Sometimes it's put, they can count, but they can't account for their counting. Because, again, it's only the Christian worldview created by God, sustained by God, uniformity of nature that explains and that, that allows for science itself to happen. Okay. Um, so I know that I'm repeating myself, but just, just to make sure you get this. Only the Christian worldview can supply a reasonable basis for the uniformity of nature. If someone wants to read a little more, uh, an article, uh, it's, a, it's an easy article to read. Uh, it was delivered, it was a lecture by one of my professors from seminary, uh, Dr. James Anderson. I'll give you the title of the lecture if you want to dive in a little more. He has a bunch of footnotes that you can, that you can, um, if you want to, you know, get deeper in this subject. James, Dr. James N. Middle initial N. Anderson, and it's called. It was a lecture he delivered. That you can just Google it, and it'll come up. The laws of nature and of nature's God: the theological foundations of modern science. The laws of nature and nature's God, uh, colon, the theological foundations of modern science. And he goes through four different things that we take, that we take for granted just in, do, in living life, in doing science, that can only be explained by a Christian worldview. The very idea of thinking itself. You know, when you do science, you actually use your mind. And your mind is working. Um, He'll argue that only a Christian worldview can actually explain the idea of a mind uh, that, that, can, that can think. Let me read just a couple paragraphs from this, um, and then we'll, we'll almost wrap up. So a couple paragraphs, let me read you what Dr. Anderson says. Um, now it has long been noted that inductive reasoning will be reliable only if a certain assumption holds, namely, that nature is generally uniform in space and time. In other words, induction assumes that the way nature operates tomorrow will be much the same as the way it operated yesterday. That's what we've been talk talk talking about. Similarly, induction assumes that the way nature operates here at this point in the universe is the way it operates in other locations. If we're going to extrapolate from past events to future events and from local events to non-local events, we have to presuppose the uniformity of nature. This raises a tricky question, however. What justifies that assumption? How do we know that nature is uniform across time and space? After all, none of us has observed all of time and space. We've observed only a tiny fraction of it, which is precisely why we have to rely on induction. The challenge of justifying this crucial assumption has been called the problem of induction and remains one of the major conundrums in the philosophy of science. For if inductive reasoning is not reliable, then our conclusions about the laws of nature are unwarranted. They're no better than leaps of blind faith. Um, let me read a couple more paragraphs. Um, of course, if any one of us were a transcendent omniscient being, i.e. God, enjoying a direct knowledge of every point in time and space, there would be no problem here. But human beings are neither transcendent nor omniscient. So it seems that a transcendent omniscient being would be a very useful ally to lean on when it comes to inductive conclusions about the laws of nature. Once again, however, that puts us firmly in the realm of theology. One further comment before moving on. It might be pointed out that we all believe that nature is uniform, and perhaps we can't help but believe it. It's just a built-in assumption, we might say. True though that may be, it's important to recognize that is not the issue here. The issue is not whether we can avoid the assumption, but what would make it a rationally well-grounded assumption. 
It's a built-in assumption. If it's a built-in assumption, it matters a great deal who or what built it in. And of course, for believers, it's God. Triune God who creates and sustains. So when we're thinking about Christianity and science, the first is, is the history. It's actually a robust history between um, the, the scientific endeavor um, and, and Christianity. The second is this, this idea that actually to do science, one must assume things that only a Christian worldview can explain. Does that make sense at all? Is that is that genuinely following along? The third one is, I'm just going to touch on this, and then it's about time to wrap up. The relationship between scientific fact and scientific theory. Between fact and theory. It's important to separate fact from theory. And here's where we go back, all the way back to the first, um, the first lesson and the idea of a worldview. That we all bring a worldview with us to all that we're doing. We all have a worldview. Every scientist, just like every person in this room, brings a worldview with them to do their to do their their science, and they bring assumptions with them uh, to the table. To put it another way, there is no such thing as a quote brute fact. And I'm quoting my my favorite theologian, Cornelius Van Til. No such thing as a brute fact. What he means is there's no such thing as an uninterpreted fact. Facts, facts are facts, but they are within a worldview. They operate within a worldview. The fact of a, of a developing baby in the womb. The fact of the Grand Canyon. The fact of the way the eye operates. It's a fact that how an eye operates. Light comes in, and, and I'm not sure all the, um, all the, how it actually works, but it shines in, and it bounces off this and that, and then this hits and that. This is the optic nerve, and that has a lot of eye problems. So I'm an amateur ophthalmologist, but um, I know it's very complicated. And everything has to fit together perfectly, right? It's very complex. Everything fits together perfectly. That fact operates within a worldview. The Christian worldview sees it as testimony and evidence of a, a, a sovereign creator. The unbelieving worldview will interpret that fact, that given uh, along lines of natural selection, evolutionary processes, etc. So it's important to distinguish between fact, that is what we observe, what you observe with the microscope, with the telescope, you observe the stars, the sky, and you get down, archaeologist gets down and, and studies in the dirt and uncovers facts, which then you know, which helps us understand the way the world works. That makes sense. But then we all bring worldviews to those facts. Um, through which we interpret and help explain the world. Everybody, everybody got that? But again, just very modest, very modest goal. Um, it's a big, huge question. I would commend that article to you. Uh, you can track down all the footnotes, and you can dive in a little bit more if you would like to. It would be a, a, great, um, a great thing to do. Um, but is Christianity, uh, what was my, my basic question was, is Christianity opposed to science? No. The history... Science assumes realities that only uh, a Christian worldview can explain and operate in a Christian worldview. And then we need, to, we need to be careful thinking about fact versus theory, the role of worldviews. And as Christians, we operate with a Christian worldview. And we want to bring that worldview with us, whatever we're doing, whether we're playing sports, um, you know, managing our finances, um, worshiping the Lord studying biology, chemistry, whatever, banking, whatever it might be, we bring our Christian worldview with us as we seek to live to God's glory. Okay, that was a lot in just a few minutes. Any thoughts or questions? Yes, Kelly? Just, just to make the link with this group back. Uh, yeah, make it clearer. Um, I think um, just bringing back to what you said earlier in the lesson, uh, where things are thought down to the fact that there are no group facts means that, you know, obviously, as you said, there are there's nothing that is left to be interpreted. That has not already been interpreted. Right. God has interpreted everything. And we are to think God's thoughts after him and interpret every set of facts after God has, has already interpreted it by examining everything in accordance with his word. And what scientists often assume is that there are facts left to be that no one has interpreted that we ought to understand not acknowledging the fact that God has already uh, interpreted himself everything about reality. Yeah, it's well put. 
book. Yeah, God is a great interpreter. So we just want to finish this book. Yeah, I like that. Real quick. A um, couple more. Uh, yeah, Angela and then Matt. Um, oh. I had a professor, Peter, who was, I, I loved what he said about, it was actually, he was in a theology class, not a science class, but he was saying, uh, basically, a lot of people try to feel like, quote unquote, protect the Bible, like, oh, close your eyes to everything mm-hmm. else and just read the Bible, which is not bad advice to read the Bible. But he was saying, basically, the Bible can handle your tough questions. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to be ignorant of everything else in order to have faith in the Bible. It can handle your uh, challenging it or questioning it or trying to evaluate it against it, evaluate other things against it. And I thought that that was, when you bring it into this subject, sure. you know, mm-hmm. you don't have to close your ears to everything that the world is saying and just, um, you know, you can, you can you can look at it and evaluate it and Matt? I was just going to, uh, oh, the other idea of facts, I read a, a, an article by an engineer a few years ago, um, and he was discussing data, mm-hmm. uh, which we would consider facts. Sure. Because data by itself is meaningless. That right. you know, we have to throw it in the graph. We have to we have to interpret it and then tell a story from it to say what that, to have any meaning from the data. Right. So it's another way to think of it. And sure. someone says, well, you got to look at the data. No, right. someone has to translate the data. And right, yeah. yeah. God is a great interpreter of Kelly, yeah. I like what said that. Just yeah. so. Yeah. Okay, there's a lot here, a lot of questions we weren't able to dive into, but just to scratch the surface, give you some bullet points maybe to help organize your thoughts, and we can talk more if you like, if you have to talk more. Um, but uh, we'll let's wrap up in prayer. Um, John, did you close in prayer? Precious Heavenly Father, as we contemplate the wonders of your creation and the, the orderliness that comes from you as the creator, the sovereign of the overall, how we thank you for that. We thank you for it. Uh, as Pastor preached this morning, that you are the, the not ever uh, creator and unchanging God, and in that we take great comfort that your love is unchanging to us through our precious Savior Jesus Christ. We pray as we have opportunity to think on these things and to share with others that we would rehearse in our minds the goodness that you have shown to us in our precious Savior Jesus.